All right, let's move on to data types. So, so far, everything we've been doing has been working with what we call strings. So let's do this. If you haven't already, I want you to see uh, where these files are being stored. If you click on Locate and Drive, you can go to your own Google Drive folder, and it should have created for you this folder called Collab Notebooks. And here I've got uh, the chapters that we've done so far. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is say File New Python 3 Notebook, and I'm going to call this right here. We're going to call it uh, Chapter 2.3 for data types. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and go back to our greeting once again. Greeting equals uh, hello world. This is what we call a string data type. Now, what is a data type? It is telling the variable or telling the, the program what type of data will be stored in this particular variable. Now, in Excel, we have the same thing. We have a, a corollary. So the data type here is text. Now, you can have, a, a, and then the data type over here is a string. Now, a string can have text and numbers in it, right? For example, I can say I am 40 years old. That has text and numbers. However, this entire cell is treated as text, or we call a string. Over here, we have the actual data type. And when it's going to be text, we can use this one to tell it specifically general. means that anything can go in there. Uh, and if we were to put a number, this one, it it's not a number. Um, Excel, it doesn't give you any errors. However, Python will if we try that. Over here, I can change this general to number. And notice it gives it a couple decimal places. I can take those off. The advantage of telling it what type of data is going to be stored in a variable is that your program will be possibly smaller depending on the data type you use. So this is uh, going to get a little bit complicated, but I want you to, to stay with me through this. and Let me see if I can explain here. So I just went to Google Images and searched for data stored on hard drive to give you an idea of how, uh, of how data is stored. So right here on this image, notice we've got this disk that spins. Now this is an old type of hard drive. We have different sorts now, but on this disk, imagine that we divide each of these rims or rings into cells. Each cell can have a 1 or a 0 in the cell. That's, kind of how, that's how a CD is, is created. Actually, here's a better picture of it right here. So imagine each of these here is a cell. Now, there are so many of these rings, you could never see them with the human eye that are on one of these disks. That's why we can fit a lot of data here. They're not this big. But in each cell, we store 0 and 1. How do we do that? Well, if it's a hard disk, we store an electron in there to indicate that it's a, a 1, or we leave it empty if it's a 0. Now, if it's a CD or DVD or Blu-ray, li we are literally burning a tick mark on the disk to indicate a 1, or we leave it blank for a 0. Now, what we do next is, let me give you an example here. Uh, we convert those ones and zeros to text. So, for example, the lowercase letter A is the combination of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1. Oh, and I'm going to have to change all these to text so it shows you all those ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1. There we go. So, what I mean by these zeros and ones is that if I were to read all these cells together in a row, I would have seven zeros and then one burnt for the number one. That means lowercase letter a. And it takes eight of those. We call this a byte, and each individual digit there is a bit. So b, it's indicated by going to the next eight cells in the disk, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, one, zero. Now, why is it zeros and ones? Because I can only have two values in one of those little cells. We call those cells a bit. So burnt or electron means one, empty means zero. So if I'm going to represent a character by ones and zeros, I'm going to have to have a lot of bits in a byte. So C, if you're getting the pattern yet, is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. D equals, oops, one, two, three, four, uh, five, zero, zero, six, seven, eight. And see how I'm just... I'm just incrementing. Oops, no, I did this one wrong. That one is one there, zero there. There we go. I'm just incrementing where my ones are. So an E, what would this one be? One, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, like that. Then F, as you can tell, I, I just keep incrementing out these ones and zeros. So if I want to represent the whole alphabet, well, how many letters are there? There's 26, right? But I also want to have uppercase characters, which means 52. 
add in numbers, that means 62. Add in non, all the weird uh, uh, non letters that you get on a keyboard. And eventually, usually there's about, the bare minimum is 95 characters. Uh, often there's more like 150, depending on what type of keyboard that you have. So how my question for you is how many bits are required to represent all, let's say, 200 characters that you could get out of a keyboard? Well, there's actually a formula for that. Here's how it works. What it is is the number of possible characters equals um, the, the number of um, values in a bit, or in other words, a cell, raised to the, let's see, to do raised to, I guess I have to do this more, right there, raised to uh, the number of bits. So for example, each bit can only have a zero or one. Each cell here can only have two values in it. So we're going to take two and raise that to the number of bits in a byte. Well, there's eight bits in a byte here. So what's two to the eight? So two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. So by having eight bits in a byte, and each bit can have only two values, that means I can represent 256 possible characters. All right, so if we want to represent data that can have text, numbers, and other word characters, then we need to have bytes that are four bits long. However, what if we only need to represent numbers? How many numbers are there? There's only 10 digits, right? So in a number, each individual number only has 10 possible options. Just like in a sentence, in a string, there's 200 plus possible options. If I'm representing a number, each digit has 10 possible options. So how many bits do I need to represent 10 possible options? Well, 2 raised to the 2 power is 4. 2 raised to the 3, 8. 2 raised to the 4 is 16. So I need at least 4 bits to represent 10 numbers. So in that case, I would say, uh, let's go down here. Let's say the number 1 is going to equal 1, 2, 3, 4. 2 is going to equal 1, 2, 3, 4. 3 equal, oops. 3 equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. And then I can represent all 10 digits. So why am I explaining all this? Back here. There are some types of variables. There, there are different types of data I can put in a variable. And if this variable is going to store text only, if it's going to store text, then my variable needs to have 8-bit bytes. But I can have variables that only have numbers in them. And in that case, it'll only need four bits per byte to represent the numbers. So, long story short, data types matter when it comes to programming languages. Let me give you one more, one more example. So, first of all, let me give, let me, let's go through the different types of variables you can have. So, we have string, that's text. We have integers, that's whole numbers. Floats, these are numbers with decimals. And then booleans, this is just true or false. So how many bits do you need to represent a true or false value? These are my only, whoops, these are my only two options. It's only a zero or one. I only need one bit. Two raised to the one equals one. Oh, sorry, equals two possible options. So I want to be very careful and make sure that I use appropriate data types for my variables. So let's give you some examples. Let's create um, a few variables and talk about how to put them together. So let's start with string here. And what I want to do is uh, let's make a let's make a new code here and let's make this reading part one. Note, remember how I can't use spaces? I can use underscores to kind of imply spaces in my variable names. Let's call this one howdy. Another variable called green part two equals earth. All right. Now what I can do with these variables is I can actually put these together. And I'm going to call make a new variable called full greeting equals. Now I'm going to reference my other two variables. Greeting 
part one plus greeting part two. Now, the plus means uh, when it's text, it's going to mean put them together. Whereas if it's numbers, it'll actually add them together. So let me show you what I mean here. So let's print now our variable called full greeting shift enter. There we go. Howdy, Earth. Now, notice the only reason I have a space is because I added a space right here. If I were to take that out, I lose my space and it's put right together there. All right, so string variable types. I can use the plus operator. I can put them together. I can take other variables and put them into a new variable. That's what it looks like. All right, let's work with some integers next. So come down here and let's make an integer. Just because I'm short on names. Integer 1 equals two integer oops integer two equals let's go to negative three sixty seven integer three equals zero into integer four let's say equals forty six thousand I don't use commas seven hundred and fifty eight there we go all right so with integers, when I go to print, and I use the plus command, integer 1 plus, actually no, sorry, I'm going to use the comma command first to show you what this does. Integer 2, integer 3, integer 4. All right. Oh, whoops, forgot my underscore. There we go. Because I use commas, uh, I can print out a bunch of variables and it will imply a space. Now the space isn't there because of this space. I can actually get rid of those spaces. The space is there because I use the comma to say, here's four things that I want to print out. Print, so see it still has the spaces there. This is a lot like, um, well, that's okay, I'll leave my Excel example out for right now. So integers can be any whole number, um, negative or positive. Uh, but no decimals. All right, let's do floats. So I'm going to say down here, um, I'm going to name these ones now, something meaningful. Pi equals 3.14. Square root uh, of 2 equals 1.41. Uh, 2 equals 2.0. Negative pi equals negative 3.14. All right, there we go. And then let's print these guys out. Pi square root 2, negative pi 2, negative, negative pi. Now, you probably are noticing that I'm just going straight through the examples in the book. Uh, you could just watch what I'm doing or look at what's in the book, copy those examples in a Google Club or... Uh, or just watch, uh, because this is really easy material. However, I wouldn't recommend that. Going through the process of typing these things out is going to build some uh, procedural memory that you'll need to actually learn programming. So go ahead and, even though I know this is pretty slow and boring, go ahead and type it out and take the time to do these things. Anyway, um, oh, I put this in twice. That was unnecessary. There we go. All right. So floats include decimals. Uh, lastly, one more boolean. One equals true. Notice, I want you to, to see what's happening here. Notice that true and false are colored purple. That's because it recognizes those as boolean data types. And it's colored them purple to know that this is different from the word true. Um, Notice that right here, what didn't I include around numbers here, here, and these true and false? Double quotes. So with variable types in programming, this goes for all language, we use double quotes around strings, no double quotes around any type of number or booleans. So if I were to put text around this, notice it gets, eliminates its uh, purple color, makes it red like my text up here. That means that bool1 is now a string and not a boolean. 
So if you've done programming before, something you'll notice is that I don't... Uh, Python in this context is not a strongly typed language, meaning I didn't have to declare up front that this was a string variable or str or anything like that. Uh, Python just went ahead and interpreted when it saw the double quotes that this would be a string. Down here, when it saw there were no double quotes and no decimals, it went ahead and converted or interpreted integer one as an integer. Same thing down here. Notice I don't have to call it an integer for it to be an integer. It all depends on what the actual value is. So down here, pi, it's not named float, even though it is a float data type, it knows pi is a float because I gave it a decimal of 0.14. All right, so these are the main four data types. There's tons and tons more, but this is 99% of what we're gonna deal with uh, in data science. So let's stop this video here, and then we're gonna take this to the next level in the next section.